don't worry, we won't go back that far, but only for one second, there's one story. So when I was five years old, I was at my mom's apartment, I was playing with my brother and sister, and halfway through the day, I started saying to my mom, my hip hurts, my hip hurts. And you know, she was like, okay, whatever, you know, go, go lay down, rest. And the night went on and we went to bed and my brothers and sisters and I, we shared a bedroom. And in the middle of the night, I woke up from the pain in my hip. And I went to walk to my mom's bedroom and I collapsed in the living room in pain. And she heard me fall and she came in and she got me and she brought me in her room and she put me in her bed. And I went back to sleep. Next morning we wake up, she's getting my brother and sister ready for school. I was in kindergarten at the time. And she kept saying, Autumn, get up. And I was like, Mom, I can't, my hip hurts, I can't, my hip hurts. To the point where she kind of got irritated with me and she was like, get up, you have to get ready. And I went to get out of bed and I collapsed out of bed, screaming in pain. Like, bloody murder, couldn't get off the floor. And my mom was like, oh shit, something's wrong. <laughs> Scoop me up, threw me in the car with my brother and sister, called my dad and was rushing me to the hospital. Couldn't even sit in the car, that's how bad the pain in my hip was. They had to carry me in, rush me in. Um, I lived in Ohio, so we had a very good children's hospital, Rainbows Babies and Children, and I was there for a week. And they ran every test humanly possible on me. They had no idea what was wrong with me. And when I say every test humanly possible, I mean they were holding me to a table with needles this long going into my hip because they thought maybe I had a flesh-eating bacteria eating away at my muscle from the inside. Lo and behold, I did not. But they didn't know what was wrong. X-rays and, and CAT scans and everything. And I was in that hospital for a week and they never knew what was wrong. A week later, they released me. I went home on crutches. And they told my parents to just be careful because they never came up with any kind of diagnosis. So here I am a week later on crutches. Okay, and slowly but surely I get better, but my parents are very hesitant to let me do certain things. It was like, yes, I could be a kid, but they told them like, careful with the sports, like she shouldn't do gymnastics. So I wanted to do gymnastics. They wouldn't let me do gymnastics. I am a dancer at heart. I was begging from the, like they, there's a joke in my family that I came out of the womb dancing because my mom never made it to the delivery room. I came out in the labor room. So I wanted to dance. They would never let me dance. Years and years and years went by and it wasn't until I was 14 years old that my dad finally let me sign up for dance class. Okay, so this was the first time ever that I had to overcome being behind everybody else for what I wanted. All those girls that I stepped into dance class with at 14 years old had been dancing since they were three and four years old. So I, they had seven, eight, nine years of training on me and I wanted to do the same thing that they were doing. I wanted to compete. So it was the first time I was behind the eight ball, okay? And I had to fight that much harder if I wanted a spot on that team. If I wanted a spot on that stage, I was gonna have to prove myself. I was gonna have to dance harder and I was gonna have to do it from my heart because I didn't have the technique that they had. Technique isn't always what's most important, but your heart will get you a lot further. So, so I did, I danced, I made the competition team. I went on to become a dance major in college, but because I didn't have the technique that these girls had, I, I auditioned for my top schools. There was no way I was getting into Juilliard or New York ballet or anywhere else. It just wasn't gonna happen. But I got into a small performing arts school in St. Louis. And I had come from this background of positive teachers. All my teachers growing up as a dancer, everything was about taking care of our bodies and just like positive criticism. And then I get to college. Mm -hmm. And how many other kids in the room? Sorry if there are. My ballet master was a bastard. Sorry, <laughs> close your ears. No, and, and I mean this in every sense of the word. This man was horrible to me. The epitome of putting somebody down, crushing their dreams, and on a daily basis telling you you're not good enough, that was him. Like, there's one st story I always share. I was in ballet class, freshman year. He calls me to the center of the floor, and he tells me, Autumn, do an arabesque. An arabesque is where you lift your leg up behind you. Okay, now, prima ballerinas with no spine lift their leg up here. I am not a prima ballerina. I didn't even want to be a prima ballerina. I was a jazz dancer. You all know I like my hip hop music. And he came up, so my leg came up parallel. And he came up behind me and he grabbed my ankle and he shoved my leg up in the air. And I said, because <gasps> my back caught. And he let go of my leg and he looked at me and he said, did it hurt? And I, I was like, yeah. And he goes, then go be a secretary. And walked away, like dismissed me back to the bar 
And that, like, that was like a daily. I didn't jump high enough. I didn't turn out enough. Uh, because my heart wasn't in ballet, I wasn't enough. Three and a half years later, I left that school with a bulging disc in my lower spine because I had gone to the doctor. I sneezed one day. I sneezed, you guys, and it took me to the ground. And I was laid up for 10 days. Went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you have a bulging disc in your lower spine. Keep dancing the way you're dancing. You'll be in back surgery by the time you're 20, and you'll probably never dance again. Okay. You're starting to see why I have no business standing up here. I had a hip that we had no idea what was wrong with, and now I have a bulging disc in my lower spine that technically requires back surgery. So he said, you know, if you stop dancing this much, you'll probably be fine. Okay, I left school. Left school with no idea what the heck I was gonna do with my life because I was gonna be a dancer. That's all I wanted to do. Took a few months off, went back to school, thought maybe I would be a physical therapist. That wasn't working out. I was learning about the water cycle and I was like, why am I paying $30,000 a year to learn about the water cycle because of the class requirements, right? So I was like, I'm not, I'm not gonna stay in here and try to figure it out. I'm gonna leave school and figure it out. And when I figure it out, I'll go back if I need to. At the time I was living in St. Louis, my only dream, you guys, was to be a dancer and go to Los Angeles. That's all I wanted to do. So I saved and I went to Los Angeles. And at the time, my mom was living in Los Angeles with my stepdad and my little brother and sister. So I moved in with my mom. Not everybody knows, some people know I don't have a good relationship with my mom, okay? We don't talk, it's now been like eight years, but at, at this time, we were still talking. So I move in with my mom, and it is not going well. Like two months into living with her, and I'm like, no, cannot do this. And I pack my bags, and I leave, and I go back to St. Louis. So again, it's a two steps forward. I got, I'm in California, like this is where I wanna be. Welcome to Hollywood, what's your dream, right? Who knows the pretty woman line? Thank you, okay. I get there, I was like, does nobody do movie lines? Is that just me? So I get there and, and two months in, I need to leave because my living situation is not conducive to staying there and I haven't saved up enough money to live in California. So I have to go back to St. Louis. But when I put something in motion in my mind, when I decide I want something, there is nothing that is going to stop me except me. So only if I decide it's not going to work out is when I'll stop. Only if I decide I no longer want it is when I'm gonna stop. I moved back to St. Louis. I work seven days a week, double shifts, waiting tables. Yes, back then you were allowed to work like that. And I saved every penny that I had. Like it turned into a game for me. Every time I get my tip money at the end of the day, like, okay, this is how much I need for bills and all the rest goes into the savings account. I was going back to California. I'm going, going, back, back, okay? But I had the date, I knew the date that I was going back, like the day I left, I knew the date I was going back. So the plan was in action, it was gonna happen. There was no, it wasn't going to happen. Went back to St. Louis, worked, saved, did everything I needed to, and a year later, I packed my car right back up and I drove my butt right back to California. And at that point, my older brother, Bobby, was now living in California. He was closer to like the Hollywood area, it was great, he showed me around, I got my apartment and I started to get on my own two feet. At this point, you guys, I hadn't danced in three years. I would not step foot in a dance class. That ballet teacher crushed my soul, literally. I thought I was no good, I couldn't do it, I, I was not meant to be a dancer. So I'm living in my little studio apartment in LA, and at the time I had a photo of Britney Spears on my wall. It was a Britney Spears calendar, because I love her. <laughs> Crazy and all. <laughs> Sorry, I do. A dancer. And I like I remember walking past the poster and thinking to myself, I said, like, God, I miss dance. And there was a studio, or there is a studio in Los Angeles, it's called Edge Performing Arts Dance Center. And it's like the creme de la creme. Like that's the dream. When I was like 11, I would say, I'm gonna go dance at the Edge Performing Arts Center. I had been in Los Angeles for a year and I still had not gone to the Edge. And so finally I sat down and I was like, okay, it's time, I'm gonna go back to jazz class. So I look up classes, but I didn't go back to jazz three or jazz four. I looked up jazz one, beginner jazz. You guys, I had danced for 10 years. I looked up beginning jazz. And that's the class I took myself to because that's the only class I thought I was gonna be good enough for. 
And lo and behold, I find another teacher who happens to be amazing. So I'm in this dance class, the teacher's great, I'm finally getting my groove back, and slowly but surely, like my confidence is being built back up. But make no mistake that that ballet teacher is still in the back, was still at that point in the back of my mind. I went on to meet one of my best friends. At the time, that was great and things were going really well. And eventually, let me fast forward a little bit, I meet the man that I ended up marrying, okay? Now, he's a lot older than me, he's 12 years older than me. So we're dating for two years, he comes, he has a child, okay? And we're talking, we're getting more serious at this point, I'm 25, 26, and we're talking about getting married. And I've been waiting tables now for years. I waited tables to put myself through college. I waited tables to pay for dance class. The guy had been waiting tables for a while. And, he, and I'm also in LA per, pursuing acting and pursuing dancing. That's what I wanted to do in LA. I wasn't dancing eight hours a day, but I could still dance. So I was still auditioning. And he says, you know, if we're, if we're gonna get married, you need a real job this acting and dancing thing is not going to help pay the bills and I don't really feel secure in taking on, you know, even more responsibility if you're just acting and dancing. Well, I was young, I was impressionable, so I gave that up. Gave it up and walked away from the acting and the dancing. And I was like, all right, he's not comfortable with it. But I also knew I didn't want to uh, wait tables forever and I knew I didn't want to sit at a desk. That is not me, okay? And so while I was trying to figure it out, I was a casting assistant for three of the worst months of my life, <laughs> sitting at a desk. It was horrible. And, and while I was sitting there, I was like, I can't do this. I have to find something else that is going to make me happy. The one thing my dad always told me was, do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And I was like, well, I don't love this. In fact, I hate this. And so I started to think about it and I was like, well, should I be a dance teacher? That's different, right? That's not auditioning, that's a steady paycheck. But I really didn't want to go back to dance. I didn't have the confidence, honestly, to go back and be a dance teacher. I could go take class for me. I could pick and I could choose what I thought I would be good at, right? I, I'm good at this, so I'll go to this class. I'm good at this. So I was living in that comfort zone of dance, but I was not ready to step outside of it and have to go teach. But I wanted to do something physical. That's when I decided to become a personal trainer. Got certified through the National Academy of Sports Medicine. It took about three months. Started working for a small business that did in-home personal training, which was great because they worked with a lot of women and a lot of kids. And at the time I really had a passion for working with kids. So I wanted that ability to do that as well. But also, I didn't go work at a gym because my now fiance said, I don't want you to work at a gym because I don't want you to work with men. I swear he's not a bad guy, you guys. <laughs> he's just old school, okay? So it was still like I was getting to do what I wanted to do, but I wasn't getting to do it on my terms. So I didn't go work at the gym, but I did a lot with this at-home personal training company. I learned a lot over three years. And then there started to be some issues, and so I left. I went out on my own. I got certified to be um, a pre and postnatal specialist. Started running my own business. And through all this time, I get pregnant. I have my son. Things are going really well, at least I think they are. My business is growing and growing and growing. And my husband is getting more and more in a funk. And I'm like, what's the problem? He's like, I hate my job. I hate my job. Okay, so he decides he wants a new job. Okay, great. He applies to become a, a manager, funny enough, at a gym. <laughs> and he gets the job, but he doesn't get the job in LA. They offer him a job in Texas. So at this point, my son is five and a half months old and my business is thriving. I have a six figure personal training business that I own, it's great. And, uh, and he says he really wants to move to Texas, what do I think? And so, you know, I tried to do the rational thing, which was like, it's a better life for my family, the cost of living. At the time, my mom was living in Texas. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm older, mom's in Texas, she can help me with the baby. And before I know it, this is like July 4th weekend, we say, yes, we're going, and we pack it up, and we're about to move to Texas. And I'm standing in my apartment with my best friend, and I'm in the back bedroom, because my husband's out in the front living room, and I'm sobbing because I know that this is the wrong move. Like, do you ever feel it in your soul? Like this is not what you're supposed to do? This is like, like every, my, I was crawling out of my skin knowing I wasn't supposed to move to Texas. We pack up the car and we move to Texas. 
So this is again, the second time I'm now leaving the one place I've ever wanted to live, which is California. We get to Texas, we're staying with my mom. I'll leave. One day I'm gonna write a book. There won't be a nice chapter. But I'm living with my mom and she's no help, I'll just say that. And every day, I'm literally crying every day. My husband's going to work, I'm trying to find a job as a trainer, and every day he comes home, and I've done nothing but cried. And I have a six month old baby. And finally, one day he goes to work, and he comes home, and I think I had called my older sister and talked to her. And I had decided, I'm going back to California with or without you. So he comes home and I said, we need to talk. I'm going back to California with or without you. Taking Dom, going back. And then this was no reflection on our marriage. We were in a very good place in our marriage. But I was like, I can't stay here. This is not where I belong. And if I don't go back right now, that business I spelt, spent the last three years building is going to be gone. And he, was, he said, okay, I understand. Like, go. I, I can't come. I need a job. So I'll wait to get a transfer, but go. You guys, I packed my five-month-old son up. Drove my butt right back to California again. I hired a nanny that could help me. I, actually, I, hold on, let me back up. I didn't hire a nanny right away. All my clients were in Los Angeles. I, could, I didn't find a nanny right away. So I was living in San Diego, it's two hours away from Los Angeles, with my mother-in-law and their family. And every morning I would get up at 3.30 in the morning and I would drive from San Diego to Los Angeles to be there in time for my 5.30 or 6 a.m. clients so she could watch my son. And I'd train all my clients, and sometimes I would take a nap in my car, and then I would drive back to San Diego two to, two to three hours, depending on traffic. Literally, for a month, I was doing this drive back and forth and back and forth. Obviously, that wears on you. While I was there, I'm on the computer one night, Dom's asleep, and I'm looking up mommy websites, you know how we do this, and I see that Brooke Burke has just launched a website called modernmom.com. And I was like, I wonder if they need like anybody to write for them. Now mind you, I'm not a writer. I don't have a, like I don't write blogs I, I, at the time. But I was like, I'm gonna just reach out to them and ask them if they ever want somebody to write an article about pre and postnatal fitness. Like, hey, I'm happy to do it. Okay. That was a whim. Didn't never expect to be here back from them. So I sent this a email, hey, this is who I am. This is my business, blah, blah, blah. I get an email the next day that is literally like, yes, we would love for you to write for modernmob.com. And I was like, oh shoot, okay. <laughs> so like, I write them one or two blog articles. And then maybe a week later, I find an apartment in LA and I hire a nanny. And I'm, like, I have no furniture in this apartment at this point. I think I had like an Ikea futon and a kitchen table and Dom's crib. And I'm sitting at my little kitchen table and my phone rings. It's Brooke Burke's assistant. Hey, so Brooke wants to know if you want to come over to her house tomorrow and film workout videos with her. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Yes. First of all, yes. But second of all, what just happened? Like, that doesn't happen. You guys, had I not sent an email on a whim asking if I could write, a week later I'm not getting a phone call asking to go to her house in Malibu and film workouts. P.S. I sucked, and yes, you can book those workout videos up. They're funny. You want to see just how far I've come? Look them up. I'm on a green tank top, my very first one. Green tank top, black shorts. It's so bad. And literally though, so I go to her house, I have no idea what I'm doing, okay? And she's like, okay, like, go out there. No, I know what I'm doing in terms of exercise. I have no idea what I'm doing in front of a camera. Like, I, I'm not good at it at all. And she says, you know, do like a 10 minute ab video or something. I'm like, okay. So I go out there, stiff as a board, talking to the camera. Okay, you are going, like, this is so bad. <laughs> Just go look it up. But here's what I'll say. I filmed those videos that day, and in between filming my stuff, I'd go in the house and I'd watch Brooke film her stuff. Brooke's been around for a while, right? She's a good TV personality. She knows what she's doing in front of the camera, and I would sit there, and I would study what she did. And I'd be like, how does she make it look so natural? And I would watch, and I'd be like, okay, it's like she's talking to her best friend. Oh, I get it, she made the camera her best friend. That's not hard. And so slowly but surely, like watching her work, I started to understand like, this is how I can be more comfortable in the camera. And each time I filmed, 
things got better and she kept inviting me back. I, I actually worked with her for three years and filmed two workout videos with her as well. So all along this process, it takes three months, my husband finally gets transferred back to LA. Great, things are good. My business is growing, or at least it was, and then the big crash hits. And what's the first thing to go when people start losing their jobs? The very expensive personal trainer. So my six-figure business got cut in half, literally cut in half in one month, and it was November, so it was the month before Christmas. So I looked at my husband and I was like, I gotta go work at a gym. Like, I need, we need money coming in. Like, I just lost 12 clients in one month. I had big clients. Like, if they're losing job and losing money, they're out. So this, is, this has been the pattern of my life. It's like something really good is going on at the exact same time that something really crappy is going on. And you, you have to pick which side you're gonna live on, right? Like, are you gonna live in the positive or are you gonna live in the negative? Because there's always gonna be both. So I start working at Equinox. Over the time, things are getting progressively worse between my ex-husband and I, just in terms of growing apart. We had always said that if we started to grow apart that badly and we couldn't fix it, and trust me, we were trying, that we would divorce before we got to a point of hating each other. And that's what we did. It finally got to the point and we're like, we're gonna be better as friends if we get divorced now than if we keep trying to do this because we were getting to the point of starting to fight. So we get divorced, fine. I'm, I'm working 14 hours a day. I'm working at Equinox. I'm seeing the private clients that I still have. He moves a mile up the street. We're both taking turns, taking care of Dominic, and everything is going good. And throughout that time, I start creating something called Change My Plate. You guys know it is the portion control system, okay? So I started developing this container system for portion control after watching my clients struggle with nutrition. Takes me a while, takes me a year and a half, two years to launch that, right? Didn't have Carl money backing me up at the time. It takes a little longer when you do it on your own. But I launch it. I launch it on the Hallmark Channel on a show called Home and Family. And six weeks after launching it, now I will say this, at that moment, yes, was I selling them out of the closet of my one bedroom apartment? Yes, I was, okay? I was everything. I was customer service, I was the website, I was packaging and I was shipping, but it was doing well. and. I had a lot of big wig clients at the, at the time, a lot of clients in the movie industry. And that didn't just come easy. That came from a lot of hard work over a 10 year period, training somebody so well that they told a friend, that they told a friend, and they told a friend. And that's how my business got built. It was treating that one stay at home mom like she was the best client ever because she was the best client ever. And she got great results and she would go tell her friend. And then that friend would get great results and they would go tell the next person. That's how I built my business. It was word of mouth. There was no social media. There was literally like, you could flyer cars, you could make business cards, you could take an ad out in the newspaper. That was it. Facebook was barely a thing. Dominic was four months old when I set up my Facebook account. I remember holding him in my arms, creating my account and being like, what is this thing? So like I had to do the legwork and I had to be really good at being a trainer if I wanted to get my next client. Because the only way I was getting that next one was to do really well with the first one. So here I am, I have these big, big clients and I have one client in particular that's very big in the movie industry. And they had watched me go through the whole process of launching Change My Plate and, they, and I gave them one. I was like, oh, look, it's done. And um, she has somebody over her house one day from Sony that they're friends with and, and she shows it to him. I think the gentleman was a little bit overweight and she was trying to give him a nudge, a nudge in the right direction. She wanted him to get healthier and she showed it to him and she's like, oh, look what our trainer created. Like, do you want to try it? And he was like, no, I really don't. <laughs> but, he, but he said, I think I know somebody who might be interested in that. And he said, can I pass it on? So she calls me and says, can I pass, can you pass it on? And I was like, well, yeah, who does he want to pass it on to? Just, just out of curiosity. She goes, I don't know, some company beach body? Dropped the phone. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah. And I, she's like, so can I pass it on? I was like, pass it on, pass it on right now. I was like, yes, pass it on. <laughs> so she does, she passes it on. A year before that though, you guys, while I was creating Change My Plate, an opportunity had come up for me to replace Jillian Michaels on The Biggest Loser. I auditioned for that show for four months. Audition, audition, audition. I mean, like literally on the weekly, I was either going in the casting director's office or filming something to give to them. And all through that time, all I wanted was to replace Jillian Michaels on The Biggest Loser. That was the coup de grace, at least I thought it was. 
And it came down to me and one other person, a lot of you guys know this story, and the casting director called me two days before they were making the announcement, and she's like, I'm fighting so hard for you. And if you don't get it, you'll know why. They're making the announcement on Monday. So this was a Friday that she called me. So sure enough, Monday, the news comes up, and Anna Kornikova is the new trainer on The Biggest Loser. And I'm pissed. I'm like, she's a tennis player. She's not even a trainer. She doesn't know what she's doing. And I'm like, you know, like that's a hit, right? That was four months of auditioning and one, you know, you make it past round one and you think, okay, yes. And then you make it past round two and you think, I'm gonna get it. You make it past round three and you're like, it's mine. And they call you and they say, it's down to you and one other person. And you're like, it's in the bag. This is gonna be the one. And then you find out not only is it not the one, but you didn't even lose it to like a trainer. You just lost it to a name. You lost it to a celebrity. That is a big blow. That is a door slamming in your face. That one definitely took the wind out of me for a minute, but I moved forward and I kept creating change my plate. So here I am a year later and they want to pass it on to Beachbody. They pass it on. This was probably November. Okay. They pass it on and I get a call the next day picking Dom up from preschool. I had to like sit down in the kid's swing because my heart was racing so bad. And I was like, okay, we're breathing and we're talking. Don't sound like an idiot. <laughs> Don't blow it before you even get the chance. And it's head of product development, Heather Church. And she says, you know, we, we, this was passed on to me by a friend and we're curious and we want to bring you in. Okay, great. Okay, but we're not going to bring you in for six weeks because the CEO is out on a ski vacation. <laughs> Jerk. <laughs> this is the longest six weeks of my life. And you analyze everything that could go wrong, all the things that you're going to say, what are you going to wear? Because clearly that's the most important thing, right? And so for six weeks, I am like this. I'm like pacing every day and I'm like, oh my God, okay, it's going to happen. It's not going to happen. Don't get your hopes up, but it could happen. Oh my God, what if it happened? Mind you, I was the girl like seven years ago that bought P90X late at night off the infomercial and said to my boyfriend who became my husband at the time, I wonder how you get to be Tony Horton. <laughs> Swear to God, the words came out of my mouth. I wonder how you get to be Tony Horton. How did, like, who do you have to know? Carl Dyker. <laughs> <laughs> so they finally go in and finally roll around. I go into the meeting. It's this big meeting room. At least it felt like it at the time. I've had many meetings in there since then. It's not as big as I thought it was. It felt enormous. And it's like Carl and Heather Church and her three assistants. And Carl comes in, being Carl sits down at the other end of the table. He's like, okay, so like, why do you want to sell your product? Like, why do you want to sell it to us? I, guys, I, don't, I couldn't even remember what I told you. I was, I was trying so hard to like, please pick me. Please, please let this be the one. Uh, and I explained to him how I don't love the business side. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have said that, but it didn't, <laughs> didn't backfire on me. But I was like, I don't like the business side. I like to help people, that's what I wanna do. Like, I don't wanna do the finance and the shipping and the da da da. And he's like, okay, great, well, you know, if we should choose to buy it from you, this is how it would go. We wanna keep you on as the face, have you create some workouts, great. And then he's like, out, like leaves the room. And Heather talks to me for a few more minutes and she asks me to tell her something about myself, I don't remember exactly what, I tell her. And they're like, okay, great. The meeting probably was 15 or 20 minutes. And I leave the meeting and all of a sudden I'm like, wah, wah. Because they tell me like, you'll hear from us. And I'm like, there goes another one. It took them six weeks, by the way, to, to get back to me. Okay. <laughs> Again, the longest six weeks of my life. But so, wait, but this is how, this is how my mind works. I leave. And I'm like, oh my gosh, did I say the right thing to Heather? Did I tell her enough about me and how I want to help people? that I sent her another email. I thanked her for the meeting, and then I re-described myself in the email, and I was like, I'm not sure if I was clear. <laughs> you guys, sometimes you just, you know, you want it so bad that you're just like, I'm gonna do anything to get it. Thank God they didn't smell my desperation. <laughs> and, and then she responded back, and she's like, no, no, it was great, we'll be in touch. Six weeks before I hear anything. And actually, at the time, I had also applied for Women's Health Magazine. They have like this contest every year for like the next top trainer. And I had applied for it before Beachbody had called. And actually, it, I had been selected as one of the top five. 
So it comes down to literally the day before I have to tell Women's Health Magazine if I'm gonna take the offer with them. Because if I sign their contract, I can't sign this Beachbody contract if it comes. And so I, I send one more email and I'm like, hey, just checking in. <laughs> and, uh, and they email back and they're like, yeah, yeah, we haven't forgotten about you. And I, I had to make the choice. I had to like put my faith that this could come through or risk blowing this by taking this women's health one. I said no to the women's health magazine. And three days later at like 10.30 at night, Mr. Jonathan Gale fan style, I get my contract. It's like a Friday night at 10.30 at night. The email comes through and I open it up and I start to read the contract. And, and I'm, I'm like reading it and I'm seeing numbers and I'm crying. And my dad lives in, I think Ohio at the time. So it's late, it's like 1.30 in the morning. And I call my dad, crying. <laughs> Probably not a great idea either. I'm full of wonderful ideas. I call my dad at 1.30 in the morning, cry I'm crying so hard I can't get the words out. So he thinks something's horribly wrong. And I'm like, dad, I did it. And he's like, did what? And I was like, my whole life just changed. Like I got the contract. So here's me signing the contract thinking like, well, that's a for sure given. Like your whole life has just changed. Not always. It did, but, I, but I'll tell you why I mean there. So I signed the contract, we go into development, we develop the program, everything's going great. We're going into rehearsals for the program. Almost a year later, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. There was supposed to be a nine week test group. It went 33 weeks. Over those 33 weeks, slowly but surely, I had to let go of all of my private clients because I had to teach a test group in the morning, a test group in the evening, and a test group on Saturday. So six days a week, I had to be at Beachbody headquarters, which was 45 minutes away from my house. So there was only so much time to see clients. That's scary. It's scary to let go of definite money for this. It's like I had the contract, there was a certain amount of development money, but it was enough to get me through development. It wasn't gonna be enough to keep paying the bills if things didn't go through. Again, I had to put my faith over here and trust that this was gonna be good because I had to let go of a lot of money over here and all those clients. So we get all the way through, we get into rehearsals for 21 Day Fix, and I had been um, getting ready to compete as well because I like to do all the things at one time. <laughs> so, so we're in rehearsals, it's, it's a week before we're gonna film 21 Day Fix. I'm carb depleted, I'm dehydrated, I'm exhausted three days into rehearsals, which were going well for me, but not going well at the same time because the director at the time didn't love me. I had actually worked background cast for her on Brooke Burke's videos and in a little video called Yoga Booty Ballet, Baby on the Way, if you all know it. <laughs> not many people know I had already done a beach body workout program. I was background cast, but she kept treating me as such. She was treating me like I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So rehearsals were getting really frustrating for me. It was building up and Three days in, I get a phone call from my ex-husband and he says, I just lost my job. I'm like, okay. And uh, mind you, again, I'm in rehearsal, okay? And he says, I just lost my job. Well, his family, remember, lives in San Diego. So I get this feeling that he's leaving. And I said, are you moving back to San Diego? And he said, yes. And I said, when? He said, Monday. It was Wednesday. He was leaving in less than a week. We have a three-year-old. And he said, I wanna take Dom with me. And I'm like, no, you're not taking Dominic with you. And he's like, what are you gonna do? I'm like, I don't know, I'll figure it out, but I can't do it right now. I have to get back to rehearsal. I get off the phone, Stephanie Saunders, who is um, head of fitness development, creates programs with me, looks at me and she's like, what's wrong? It was all I could do to just say one word. I said, room. I said, room, go over there. I needed to go to a room, so I needed to cry. And so we go in a room, she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, oh my God, he lost his job. I gotta do it all by myself. Because at the time we were sharing custody. We both saw Dominic every day. One of us took him to school, the other one picked him up and we took turns as to whose house he would live at. We lived a mile away from each other. And I was like, he's leaving. I gotta do it all by myself. My life is falling apart. She's like, slow down. Your life isn't falling apart. It's just beginning. You're good. She's like, let's get through rehearsal, hire a nanny. You're gonna be fine. I'm like, okay. So I breathe, I go back to rehearsal. Nobody has a clue what's going on. Great, leave rehearsal on Friday, go to register for my fitness competition that I'm doing on Saturday. Get there, I'm pretty depleted at this point in time. I'm pretty nauseous, pretty woozy, but I'm holding it together. 
I'm driving home, I'm like, okay, I'm registered, tomorrow's the big day. I'm, I'm driving well, by the way, and this motorcycle comes flying up on my right, catches his peg on my front bumper and rips it off my brand new Mercedes. And the only reason I say that is because I had driven a little Honda Civic for a very long time and I had just bought myself that car four months earlier. And I'm like, come on, like, what is happening? Again, remember I said, there's always something good going on and then there's always some crap happening on the other end of it. So I'm getting ready to film what could be the biggest program of my life. And my ex-husband says he's leaving. I have to figure out how to take care of my three-year-old completely on my own now. And my front bumper gets ripped off and I'm just like, Whoa. I throw my hands in the air. I'm like, whatever. Like, I can't deal with this right now. I compete, it's great. I take six, go home, I rest. We get on set. We're ready to film the videos. Everybody is there. When you're a new trainer, everybody's there. They want to make sure you don't mess up, including Carl. And I was like, can you, can you ask him to like go in the back room? Because I can't look at him. And like, I'm nervous enough. Like I can't have his judgment while I try to film this. So they put him in a back room. <laughs> Thank you. And I was like, thank you, God. And uh, they're like, okay, so like, let's just do one take and we'll see how it goes. Okay, great. So we do the first take, they yell action. We film all 30 minutes, right? There's, there's no cutting, we film all 30 minutes. And we finish filming, they say cut, and, and everybody's just sort of standing there staring at me blankly. And I'm like, oh crap. The guy really, really sucked on that one. Like I'm waiting for the lecture because nobody's saying anything, the room is silent. And the director comes out, remember the director that wasn't being so nice to me? And she comes out and she calls me Boo. And she comes out and she goes, Boo. And I'm like, what? And she goes, never in all my years of filming fitness videos has anybody gotten it on the first take. And I was like, yes, okay, finally, like, let's do this. And she's like, let you ready? And I was like, yeah, she goes, let's go. Carl left, he didn't really need to stay anymore. <laughs> It was a big relief. But anyways, we filmed the videos and then I have to wait six months before any of you guys even find out who I am. With that, that program was filmed and in the can for six months. I was in this waiting limo period, not knowing what my life was going to be. So once again, having to trust, having to figure out what do I do next? I can't promote it yet. But all the while, good things, hard things, good things, hard things. And even now, you know, Michael introduced this as me being an entrepreneur, and that is what I want to explain to you guys, that even after 21 Day Fix, and obviously went on to be a massive hit, you know, we sold in, in eight hours what they expected to sell in the first week, and sold in the first week what they expected to sell in three months, and you guys hated everybody because everything was on back order for three months. <laughs> it's a good problem to have. Even now, though, I am still an entrepreneur, and I still have to ask for what I want. And there will be times that doors are closed in my face. Because that cookbook did not happen just because Carl came up to me and was like, let's make a cookbook. You guys were asking me like, hey, we want more recipes. I was on a, we were on a plane. We were flying back from like, I don't know, one of our big events. Everybody was on the plane, corporate. And I said to him, I was like, you know, I think we should do a cookbook. And he was like, why? I'm like, people are asking for it. And he was like, oh, all right, well, let's do, we'll do one. We'll do one like that. And then they weren't going to bring enough of them to Summit. The year it launched, they wanted to bring 5,000 of them to Summit. And I was like, but you have 20,000 people coming. And they're like, yeah, but we're not going to sell that money. And I was like, are you insane? Like, you better bring more. You're going to have people really mad. And I had to go in and I had to fight for it. And not a fight for it in a mean way, but like a fight for like, I believe that this is going to be a big deal. Like, we made it. Bring the books to Summit. And he goes, fine. Fine, we'll bring 10,000 and we'll ship 5,000 back. Yeah. We didn't ship any back. We sold out in two days. And we sold almost a half a million copies of that cookbook in the first year alone. Okay? But again, would it have happened if I hadn't asked for it? No. So, so I, I, again, it's a very long story. It's hard to sum your life up in an hour or 45 minutes. But, but, Throughout that story, I just want to point out to you what I can look at now and say are the six th things that I think you need to do to be a successful entrepreneur. And the first one is to not be afraid to ask. 
You can't be afraid of the no. You can't be afraid of somebody saying no. You have to go ask again. I actually did a post about this on social media the other day that if you ask and what's the worst that's gonna happen? They're gonna say no. Will that kill you? Absolutely not. You go ask again. If you let the no, if you let the first no stop you, you will never be an entrepreneur. You better expect no than you expect yes more often, at least at the beginning, right? It takes time. Even if you know in your heart that it's supposed to happen, that doesn't mean every other person out there knows. You're gonna have to do the work. You're gonna have to do the work again. You're gonna have to do the work again. So first and foremost is not to be afraid to ask for what you want. I truly believe that's the only reason I'm standing here is that I am the person that so much so believes in something I want and it's not in an arrogant way. It's just if I want something, like I said, the only thing that's going to stop me from getting it is me. And that's not because I'm gonna let a setback stop me, that's because I, if and when I get to the point where I choose to no longer pursue it, then that's my choice. But I refuse to let my future be in the hands of somebody else. And what I mean by that is, you don't get to tell me I'm not good enough. I had a lot of people tell me I'm not good enough. I had my mom ask me when I moved to California why I thought I was gonna make it and why did I think I was any better than anybody else that lived in California. The one person that's supposed to have your back she wasn't asking in a nice way. She was asking like, oh, what makes you think you're so good? Okay, so if you let that person knock you down or crush your spirit, you won't get there. You guys are going to face this. We all have these things in our life. We all have a Gary Hubler in our life. Gary Hubler is my ballet master that breaks our spirit. You wanna know when the worst of that came out? It wasn't when I took myself back to dance class. It was when Carl asked me to create a dance program called Country Heat. Every fear, anxiety, and self-doubt came up through that entire creation process. It wasn't pretty. I had to work through all of my crap. I did. It was like the most therapeutic program ever, but it was there and it was not cute. In fact, one time I told Carl, he was yelling at me about something. He was yelling. I showed him a workout from Country Heat and he was like, that wasn't the one I wanted to see. But I was like exhausted and again, all of my anxiety and self-doubt was there and he was kind of yelling at me about it. And, uh, and I was like, I'm gonna walk away from you now. Which is weird to say to the CEO, right? But I was gonna cry, so I don't wanna cry about it. I was like, I'm gonna walk away from you now. And he's like, what? And I like walk in the other room. So he comes in there and I'm like sitting on the floor crying. He's like, what's going on? And I was like, I'm this close to throwing myself down the effing stairs just so I don't have to do this program. Because it was killing me. All of my self-doubt was taking over. Like, ever, I didn't believe in myself. Like, and I thank God he is the good mentor that he is, and he was like, okay, now's my time to back off, and he talked me off the ledge. But like, it all kept coming up. I just kept hearing Gary Hubler in the back of my head, you're not good enough. You can't do it. What makes you think you can? You can't let that person get in your head. It will stop you. Okay, the next thing I think that everybody needs to do is see setbacks as redirects. I talk about this a lot. I don't have failures. Now, if you asked me that 10 years ago, if I had failures, I could rattle off a whole long laundry list of failures I've had in my life. I could still rattle off failures right now. I just closed a restaurant that was open for two weeks. That was fun. But is it a failure? No. Is it a redirect? Yes. You guys, if I didn't have every single failure that I had, I wouldn't be standing on this stage. If Biggest Loser had said yes to me, I would have been that person replacing Jillian Michaels. And let's just be honest, there was nobody that was gonna replace Jillian Michaels on that show. She had that spot. And anybody that has stepped into it since, they haven't had the same career that she has. Thank God they didn't pick me. Because I would choose to be standing here any day of the week over having stood there. Did I know that at the time? No, I didn't know that this was coming a year later. So you can't look at those failures as failures. You have to look at them as the redirects. It's the train tracks being switched to put you in the direction you're actually supposed to go. Every time something comes up that feels like life is kicking you when you're down, if you can just shift your mindset to the it's a redirect. 
It's a redirect. This isn't my path. We think we know what our path is supposed to be, and we think we know what time frame it is supposed to happen in. I thought I should have been up on this stage when I was 27 years old. In my mind, I, that's when I wanted it, right? I want it right now. Like, I'm not willing to wait. I'm the most impatient person in the world. But if I give up on my dreams because it's not happening in my time frame, that's on me. It happened. It just happened like 10 years later than I expected it to. Thank God I kept pushing through or I wouldn't be standing here. So it's the same for you guys, right? Whether you're a new coach or you've been a coach for a while, maybe your business was doing well, maybe you know, you've seen a shift in the business over the last, last two years. If you look at it as failures, if you look at it as I lost a coach or I didn't sign somebody and that's a failure and I'm not meant to do this, even though in your heart you want to do this, that is you stopping yourself and that is you looking at it as a failure instead of what it really is, which is a redirect. Maybe it's redirecting you to take a look at how you approach the business. Maybe it's a redirect telling you to look at yourself first, be the proof the product works. Maybe you're not living that story. Maybe you're not sharing your truth yet and if you're not doing that, then you're not attracting your tribe but they're not failures, they're redirects. So we just need to change the mindset there. Okay, number three, work what you have while you work for what you want. This is a big one that I believe in. We always are looking ahead, right? I want that goal. I wanna be, I wanna be in the top 10, I wanna be an elite. Great, work with what you have while you work for what you want. You can only work with what you have. You have to grow this to get to that. That is not going to be just handed to you. Listen, we would all love to grow up with very rich parents that are very famous that make it very easy for us to get where we want to go in life. That's not going to happen for like 99.9% .9 of us. We're going to have to work. So you have to work with what you have. You work your business. If you have one coach, you work with that one coach. If you don't have any coaches, you work on you. You become the proof the product works, but you work with what you have while you're working to get to where you wanna go. That's the only way to get there. I worked with every one of those private clients. Every time I stepped foot in somebody's house, they were my only priority. That hour was theirs. And they were gonna get 110% of me because again, their success was gonna be my success because if they got results, they were gonna tell a friend and that friend was gonna come find me. So. You're gonna work with what you have while you work for what you want. You only truly fail if you stop going after what you want. Like I said, I'm like a freight train. When I put something in motion there, it's very hard to stop me. You're probably not going to. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons I ended up here. It, it was not, there's nothing, there's nothing inside of me that you guys don't have as well. Except maybe a feisty Italian personality that when somebody told me I couldn't do it, my attitude was watch me. Don't believe me, just watch. Like, I, I just didn't let somebody tell me that I couldn't do it. So you need to have that exact same attitude. That the only way you're going to stop is if you choose to stop. Not because somebody else is going to stop you. Okay, treat everyone like they are your best friend and your dream client. This is a big deal. This is a big deal for you guys too. You never know who's going to turn into your best coach or your best challenger that brings you 10 new friends, right? When you meet somebody brand new, you don't, you don't know them. You don't know their life. That's a joke that we always have. You don't know me, you don't know my life. But it's true, you don't know them yet and you don't know who they know and you don't know what their work ethic is and you don't know what their results are going to be. So you treat everyone like they are your best friend and your dream client. They all get the exact same attention, okay? If, if your favorite celebrity reached out to you and was like, hey, what's that ultimate portion fix thing that you're selling? I want in on it you would backflip and bend over and respond and motivate and encourage and inspire them until the cows came home. You do the exact same thing for Betty Sue right down the street because you don't know who she knows. You don't know who her family is and her relatives are. So you need to treat everybody like they are your best friend and your dream client. Okay, last thing is sometimes you have to go back to go forward. That's a big one for me. I had a lot of setbacks, a lot of things I had to overcome. Taking myself back to jazz one. I needed to go back to jazz one, not because I couldn't dance, but because I had to build my confidence back up. Sometimes you just have to go back to the basics. 
to be able to move forward in life. So don't be afraid of it. If, if you're here and you're struggling for any reason, or like I said, if it comes a time where you lose a couple coaches, that's okay. Go back to the basics. We have this entire success club system now that is built around the basics of coaching to help you guys get to the next step. Ultimate portion fix. We have the entire master series going on. That is taking you to the basics of what a coach is every single month that you watch that. We're talking about challenge group guides. We're talking about inviting via social media. We have a whole thing on business and, and, and different people. Carl speaking. Um, I have one of our big coaches speaking. Michael will eventually speak on there. We've got guest experts coming on. Go back to the basics. What got you going in the first place? Everybody thinks it's all about a fancy post or like I have to be so great at creating graphics or like I have to have like some amazing challenge group. Your challenge group should be amazing because you're in it and you're creating camaraderie in there and you're creating an environment that people want to come in to and you're helping them be successful. That's what it's about. It's not about whether or not you have like the most beautiful Instagram page that all has like the same filter on every picture. That's a big thing right now. I've had like three, three of my people that do my PR and stuff. They're like, really, you should start doing that whole filter thing. And I was like, I will not. I'm not gonna buy into this. I was like, I have more important things to do than worry about the filter on my photo. I'm not gonna worry about if it's the cover. But you guys, you get caught up in that, right? It's more important about sharing your story. What is your story? That's what you wanna do. Go back to that. Go back to telling about why you started with Beachbody. Uh, I hear Becky uh, Brissett tell her story all the time. And when she goes back to her basics, because it's been a long time and a long journey for her, her, her going back to basics was she signed up to be a beach body coach so she could afford diapers. She just wanted a little extra cash to buy diapers for her babies. Go back to sharing your story. Go back to whatever it was that got you involved here. There's, there's basics behind being an entrepreneur that you have to follow. It doesn't happen overnight. I didn't wake up one day and say, how do you get to be Tony Horton? And then end up standing on this stage the next week. It was 10 years later that I got the call. And even now it's been another five years of work. And when I say work, I mean like every day work. I put everything I can into the programs that I create for you guys. Partially for me, because that is my work ethic and I want to give you guys the best thing possible. And you guys, I hope, take that much pride in your work. That when you're creating your challenge groups, when you are creating your posts, that you're really thinking about putting out something that's truly going to help somebody. But it's also because I want you guys to have the tools to be successful. They are there. You all have the same opportunities. I know you look at people like 10 star diamonds, 20 star diamonds, superstar diamonds, and whatever all the other rankings are and think like, well, they're so far ahead of me, but we've watched underdogs do it. We watched Emily Fowler come out of nowhere last year and, and come up to number three. Um, they were going over the rankings the other day and some of the people that are in the top 10 right now are coaches I've never even heard of. They're coming out of, you guys come out of nowhere. You can be the underdog that comes up to the top if you're willing to put the work in. But the work starts with you. It doesn't start with how many challengers do I get in. It starts with what am I willing to work on on myself so I can share my story and help more people. Yeah. So thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate it. I am so proud of all of you for being here. Obviously you have to earn your way into this lovely vacation. So enjoy it. Autumn Calabrese. Woo!